The essential act of war is destruction, not necessarily of human lives, but of the products of human labor. War is a way of shattering to pieces or pouring into the stratosphere or sinking in the depths of the sea materials which might otherwise be used to make the masses too comfortable and hence in the long run too intelligent. Even when weapons of war are not actually destroyed, their manufacture is still a convenient way of expending labor power without producing anything that can be consumed. A floating fortress, for example, has locked up in it the labor that would build several hundred cargo ships. Ultimately, it is scrapped as obsolete, never having brought any material benefit to anyone. And with further enormous labors, another floating fortress is built. In principle, the war effort is always so planned as to eat up any surplus that might exist after meeting the bare needs of the population. In practice, the needs of the population are always underestimated, with the result that there is a chronic shortage of half the necessities of life. But this is looked on as an advantage. It is deliberate policy to keep even the favored groups somewhere near the brink of hardship because a general state of scarcity increases the importance of small privileges and thus magnifies the distinction between one group and another. By the standards of the early 20th century, even a member of the inner party was an austere, laborious kind of life. In time, the consequences of being at war, and therefore in danger, makes the handing over of all power to a small caste seem the natural, unavoidable condition of survival. War, it will be seen, not only accomplishes the necessary destruction, but accomplishes it in a psychologically acceptable way. In principle, it would be quite simple to waste the surplus labor of the world by building temples and pyramids, by digging holes and filling them up again, or even by producing vast quantities of goods and then setting fire to them. But this would provide only the economic and not the emotional basis for a hierarchical society. What is concerned here is not the morale of the masses, whose attitude is unimportant so long as they are kept steadily at work, but the morale of the party itself. Even the humblest party member is expected to be competent, industrious, and even intelligent within narrow limits. But it is also necessary that he should be a credulous and ignorant fanatic, whose prevailing moods are fear, hatred, adulation, and orgiastic triumph. In other words, it is necessary that he should have the mentality appropriate to a state of war. It does not matter whether the war is actually happening, and since no decisive victory is possible, it does not matter whether the war is going well or badly. All that is needed is that a state of war should exist. The splitting of the intelligence which the party requires of its members, and which is more easily achieved in an atmosphere of war, is now almost universal. But the higher up the ranks one goes, the more marked it becomes. It is precisely in the inner party that war hysteria and hatred of the enemy are strongest. In his capacity as an administrator, it is often necessary for a member of the inner party to know that this or that item of war news is untruthful, and he may often be aware that the entire war is spurious and is either not happening or is being waged for purposes quite other than the declared ones. But such knowledge is easily neutralized by the technique of doublethink. Meanwhile, no inner party member wavers for an instant in his mystical belief that the war is real and that it is bound to end victoriously with Oceania, the undisputed master of the entire world. All members of the inner party believe in this coming conquest as an article of faith.
and tie him to the post with his eyes covered. Then they yell, in the name of the people, shoot the anti-revolutionary convict. And three soldiers shoot three shots, three shots, three shots. So nine shots from each soldier. They also yell, if any of you tries to escape, you'll end up like this. of such a state are absolute, as the pharaohs or the Caesars could not be. They are obliged to prevent their followers from starving to death in numbers large enough to be inconvenient, and they are obliged to remain at the same low level of military technique as their rivals. But once that minimum is achieved, they can twist reality into whatever shape they choose. The war, therefore, if we judge it by the standards of previous wars, is merely an imposture, but though it is unreal, it is not meaningless. War, it will be seen, is now a purely internal affair. In the past, the ruling groups of all countries, although they might recognize their common interest and therefore limit the destructiveness of war, did fight against one another, and the victor always plundered the vanquished. In our own day, they are not fighting against one another at all. The war is waged by each ruling group against its own subjects. And the object of the war is not to make or prevent conquests of territory, but to keep the structure of society intact. The very word war, therefore, has become misleading. It would probably be accurate to say that by becoming continuous, war has ceased to exist. A peace that was truly permanent would be the same as a permanent war. This, although the vast majority of party members understand it only in a shallower sense, is the inner meaning of the party slogan, War is Peace.